Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to session 2AA on the um, GSE um, co virtual conference 2021. Um, I'm going to hand over now to um, Malcolm Beatty of IBM, who's going to talk to you about OpenShift on Z, uh, practical experience, and another year on. Over to you, Malcolm. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so, and, and please, um, any questions into the chat, and I'll monitor the chat. Yes, yes, please do. So, so as Dave says, um, I'm happy to qu take questions uh, you know, w whenever you like. So all the way through the presentation is fine. And I will also leave a gap at the end for questions, but don't feel you have to wait until then. Uh, the, the more the more interaction, the better. Otherwise, I just you know keep rambling on as always. So uh, hello, yes, for those that don't know me, uh, my name's Malcolm Beatty. Uh, I work for IBM, for IBM Systems Lab Services in the UK. Uh, and I work mainly with um, Linux and virtualization on Z although I do a few other things as well. And uh, I've been run, running OpenShift for quite a long time now, quite a number of years, and, and on Z since it, uh, it, since it arrived on Z, you know, OpenShift 4 on Z, and actually OpenShift 3 before that. Um, but I've sort of had a fair amount of practical experience now with sort of my own systems and a system of my own kind of in, in, in production this last year. Uh, and, and with uh, customers and so on. So last year I did a session on you know, practical experience, and this is a, an updated and refreshed version of that. Uh, and these are the GSE charts. So there's a charity raffle there. So you'll be seeing this chart, I think, on, on all presentations. So it'll be on the downloads as well. Uh, there's a chart here on becoming a member of GSE UK. And after that, it's it's onto onto my stuff. Um, so this is what I put as the agenda, and and those that were uh, that that did see last year's, the the focus has has changed rather. So I sort of updated it rather more recently uh, the, than than I'd have hoped to do. And what what happened is that the the planning section got bigger. And the uh, and the other sections kind of got smaller because the you know the, the stuff that you're running on OpenShift you know it's, it's kind of okay you know mostly works there's nothing particularly different about it now um, so what the focus is going to be on this time is on the kind of the planning side and the the, the Z view of the world and the th kind of the things that are relevant to Z and I'll cover some stuff on disk storage as well because the Disk storage part really is the more complicated than you than, than you might hope, in the sense that there are there are lots of options and there's this kind of inherent complexity. Uh, it, it's not complex just for the sake of it, but when you get down to what the 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 disk storage is is providing and the ways that it's doing it, there are there are lots of, of options and there are lots of trade-offs. Uh, and then I'll mention a, a bit about uh, pipelines at the end. There's kind of a chart on pipelines and a chart on software, and I'll leave a gap for, for questions at the end uh, if I get the timing right. So this is how the, the original presentation started with Z-specific differences. And, and last year we were, we were halfway down those dates. Um, and I sort of pointed out that at the time, we had just become uh, uh, sort of timely in releases, rather than the catch up that we were we were playing when kind of 4.2 came out and 4.3 and things like that. Uh, and the nice point is now that the the the, the story is there's no story. So yeah, we we we're, we're caught up. Releases on Z are at the same time, uh, and there are still sort of a few differences, which I will go on to in the next couple of charts, but in terms of the, you know, the release schedule and things like that, we've caught up and we're staying, staying caught up. So you, you, that's not that's something less to uh, to have to worry about. Um, so now on to sort of Z specific things, and 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 these are the Z restrictions. So in each version of of uh, OpenShift Container Platform of OCP. There are things which are unique to particular architectures or platforms. 
Um, and as you might expect, the you know the, the, your basic Intel stuff on your basic Intel virtualization and cloud platforms is uh, uh, mo mostly tends to all be there. Uh, and, and then there are a few gaps. Um, and so what we're going to look at here are kind of the, the, the Z restrictions. And they're all documented in the release notes. You know, you can go and have a look at them. But I've tried to sort of pick out a few here that I think are, are um, sort of more, more, more relevant than others. Um, so the list of features that are unsupported is now pretty small. The Multus CNI plugin uh, is still there as unsupported. And before 4.9 or possibly 4.8, depending on kind of how you count. Uh, also, there was a, you know, when you installed a node, then you'd install it with one network interface and it would be a pain. You know, you'd have to kind of dig below the covers a bit. To, 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 to try to deal with, with, with anything more than that. Um, as of 4.9 or, or 4.8, you can now use multiple network interfaces um, and, and kind of take advantage of things like that. There's a higher level thing though called the, the, the Malta CNI plugin and con uh, CNI is the container network interface, I think. Uh, which corresponds to CSI, so container storage interface, if you come across that. So CSI allows all sorts of different storage vendors and technologies to plug into a, a Kubernetes or OpenShift system without having to fiddle around with low level configuration within the cluster. CNI is a similar thing for networking. So what Multus does is it not only lets you have multiple network interfaces at the node level, it lets you present those nicely to, uh, you know, to pods and, and, and things that want them. Uh, and that's still not there yet on Z. It's a nice to have, uh, you know, I've, I've never found it could have that missed it that desperately, but what, in my opinion, you know, we, we're kind of going to start to see is more complex networking topologies to, to take advantage of things like, you know, rocky and low latency networking and multiple different networks and isolation and things like that. Uh, and Multus will be nice to have as we sort of make those, you know, pr present those to the users of the cluster more nicely. But as I say, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on it. I'd like to see it get here. I'm thinking possibly it might get here reasonably soonish, um, but I don't know for sure. Uh, a couple of CSI things there. So CSI volume cloning and volume snapshots uh, still aren't there. So you kind of can't drive those from the, uh, um, uh, from, from, from the cluster side, which is, a, again, a bit of an odd emission and I'd, I'd, I'd like to see that. Um, and NVMe, so the NVMe Express that the the features the I/O features the cards that you plug into your ZKEC, within which you as a customer install a nice fast NVMe SSD, uh, and the then your Z LPARs and virtual machines have insanely fast low latency access uh, uh, to that. That's not available yet as a uh, uh, supported within the cluster. There's going to be one or two interesting things that I can see that that, that, that makes possible. So I'm, I'm keeping my eyes open on that as well. Uh, there's also this comment on the, on the uh, release notes that persistent non-shared storage must be provisioned using, and then a list of methods there. And what that's really saying is that the local disks that are available on Z are kind of those things rather than if you look at something like um, you know, AWS, um, then you have uh, sort of e EBS volumes and various other clouds have kind of cloudy ways of plugging in something that looks local to the node. And that then gives the opportunity for the cluster itself to go and control those and do things for you quite nicely. Um, those aren't there at that level uh, um, on, uh, on, on Z. There's a slight exception there, but let, let's skip that for now. 
Okay, so that's restrictions. What about enhancements? So as open C OCP uh, versions go by, new things get introduced. And the way that things are introduced tend to be either as um, technical previews, uh, and that should say TP, I've made a typo there, or immediately as generally available. Um, and what would one would then expect to happen is that in a later version of OCP, technical previews become more solid and uh, and therefore become generally available and hence part of the you know, part of the user support structure. Um, so some of the things that, that come along either uh, uh, whether or not there are slight differences between Z and non Z, some of the things that I think are interesting are these ones. So um, pipelines, OpenShift pipelines um, on Z became technical preview in 4.7. So it's been around a decent while now, uh, became GA in 4.8 um, earlier this year, 4.9 is just out. Um, on Intel, it became GA in 4.7. So it's been GA on there a bit longer. And I've got a chart on um, pipelines later on in, in this session. So I'll, I'll, I'll cover that then. Uh, OpenShift serverless, I notice has become GA in, in 4.8. And that's, um, that's interesting, if only because serverless stuff is, is good of, of interest industry-wide. So um, here it is on serverless. And, and as you might expect, that's based on the underlying Kubernetes serverless stuff, which is a K-native. Uh, uh, and it's all that, that, that stuff there. Um, encrypting data in etcd, and so etcd being the, the underlying key value store for the cluster, where all the objects that you create get, uh, uh, get stored in the control plane. Uh, it's kind of the, the only stateful part of the cluster other than what your you know, workloads and pods are doing persistent volumes and things like that. The underlying meta storage of the cluster itself is in etcd. Um, and because encryption of that needs fairly low level fiddling around, um, it, it, it arrived on different platforms. And even within Intel, different platforms and ways of encrypting things sort of arrived in, in, in dribs and drabs there. Uh, arrived on Z in, in 4.8. And obviously there's different levels of, of, of encrypting these things as well. Uh, three node cluster support arrived in 4.8. Uh, so what you'll see as I go on to the main part of this uh, presentation and on, and on to all of the planning stuff, uh, we'll mostly be talking about um, three control plane nodes and some compute nodes. and what three node cluster support lets you do, it's for small clusters where you don't have, you know, you don't want to have separate control plane nodes and, and, and uh, compute nodes. And it lets you create just a three node cluster where you always have the three for the control plane, but you're also wanting, running the workloads on, on there as well. The only thing smaller than that is a is a one node cluster, and that needs more extreme ways of, of prodding things to behave, because in the underlying control plane, the etcd stuff and, it, and its clustering really, really wants you to have more than one of them, because if there's only one, there is absolutely no you know, redundancy or high availability or anything else. So a one node cluster is what's implemented with CRC, so that's code ready containers. And that's the download and go OpenShift cluster that you can put on your PC or laptop, whether it's you know Linux, Windows, Mac OS. Uh, but that uh, CRC itself is not available on Z because, as you might expect, it's just a kind of a, a developer desktop uh, um, experience rather than a, um, than anything that you'd even remotely think of putting in production. And there's a support for multiple network interfaces that uh, arrived in Z in uh, 4.9 or possibly 4.8. Okay, so here we go with the 
the main part. And, and I guess that the, the main reason that, that planning has become this main part of practical experience is that in practice, this is the stuff that I spend an awful lot of time doing with customers and trying to go through with them and explain and consider and you know uh, and, and have decisions made and things like that because I say that the higher levels of things are there's not really much Z difference to, to some extent uh, there are but but you know, these this really with the planning and the ways that you decide resources and networking and CPUs and disks and all of those sorts of things is is really the, the the part where you need to think of things from a Z point of view when you're implementing on Z, just as you'd have to think from a you know AWS point of view if you're putting it on there or a, a IBM Cloud point of view if you're putting it on there. Uh, and really, the starter point is, and I, I realise that I'm kind of assuming a level of of understanding of OpenShift in all of this presentation. It, this isn't a, you know, a basic intro to, to what OpenShift and Kubernetes are. Um, but you know, the starting point here is that a, a node is just a virtual machine. Uh, and you can run it on bare metal on some platforms, but nearly always you're, you're, you're running it as a, as a, as a virtual machine. Uh, and on that Z, that means ZVM or KVM. Uh, so it arrived first with ZVM and KVM support arrived in uh, 4.7. So you now uh, you now get the choice. And nodes themselves are just virtual machines, and and, and we're used to those on Z. So what about the number of nodes? Well, uh, well, the default cluster install uh, you create the three control plane nodes and two or more compute nodes. Uh, and as I mentioned just before, as of 4.8, you now have this choice of a three node cluster. So there you just have your three control plane nodes, your three virtual machines, and those control plane nodes are running your workloads as well, rather than your workloads being separated off onto, onto separate nodes. And again, that's not normally what you do for any kind of normal or production use but maybe for kind of small sand pits and play pens and, and, and things like that, it might be worth considering. And uh, yes, there have to be three control plane nodes. Um, you know, kind of five is the only other even vaguely sensible possibility. Uh, you can't just have two. And it comes down to the way that that underlying XED cluster, that, that distributed key value store does things. Um, it has to have an odd number of them for, uh, um, you know, for, for quorum and fencing reasons and split brain and all of that nasty low level uh, uh, cluster stuff that applies to all clusters, whether they're, you know, open shift or anything else. Uh, so if two of your control plane nodes are down, then, you know, things are bad till you bring them back up again. Uh, if you manage to lose the data, then uh, uh, you know your, your your entire cluster is 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 gone is toast yeah so uh, recovery at that point means you need to recover the data from the the XCD metadata and uh, you know it, it's documented how you do that just as for all kind of low level backup and recovery things but uh, if you're at all thinking of a production cluster then uh, <laughs> please don't forget that um, then in terms of number of nodes splitting out some of these internal pieces from from normal compute nodes onto separate ones uh, uh, can be good. So the most common reason to do that is what tend to be called infrastructure uh, nodes. And there are there are two entirely separate reasons why that can be a good thing. And one of them is from a licensing point of view. So uh, if you put things on, if you put certain of these internal uses onto, uh, uh, separate them out onto their own nodes, and you mark, mark those nodes, you label them as this is an infrastructure node. What mi that means is that, that node no longer attra uh, attracts uh, license costs, OCP license costs. And so OCP is licensed by um, VPC, Virtual Processor Core, and I've got a, a, a bit about that later on because there's some 
really good news for that on Z, let's say, for something which I, I have found difficult to have uh, um, been confirmed for, for, for far too long. Um, so from a licensing point of view, these pieces of the kind of internal use of the cluster, so the, the HA proxy load balancers, uh, the image registry, um, the, the, the pods that go around gathering all the metric information from everything that's running, both your own workloads or can be your own, well, the kind of mostly cluster internal stuff. Um, and also for ODF, so that's OpenShift Data Foundation, which was formerly known as OpenShift Container Storage. And most of my charts I've had to put in ODF brackets OCS, and some of the charts will also remind what that is because it's, it, it's not only uh, traditional IBM that does rebranding and name changes, <laughs> uh, 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 Red Hat, Red Hat, the I, Red Hat part of IBM uh, have done that for, um, for, for this as well. So if you've been aware of OCS, OpenShift Container Storage, it's now known as ODF, OpenShift Data Foundation. Uh, so that's all the licensing reason, but also um, having those some of these internal things move onto their own nodes, so onto their own virtual machines, can be really good from a from a performance uh, point of view. Not not always making things run faster, because if you're moving this onto a separate virtual machine, then you have extra traffic sometimes between that virtual machine and the virtual machine that it's talking to, whether that's your own workloads or other other cluster stuff that it's talking to. Um, but the point is that quite a lot of the traffic that it needs to do is within the kind of the own infrastructure node and also it reduces variability. So if you don't separate things out like that, then you get some situations where some bit of the internal cluster stuff happens to be running on the same node as your pod and things are going you know, really, really well because it's you know it's local networking and then you know something happens something gets scheduled on a, on a on a different node or scaled up or moved just for you know for for internal cluster reasons or whatever and all of a sudden it's now on a different node and what used to be local is now going through kind of multiple hops um and and possibly even kind of three hops depending on you know this is something talking to multiple things and the and the latency goes up and so it's that variability which is a bit unpleasant when you're running you know workloads that you want to behave uh, in a in a predictable manner and the uh, the the burblingen lab the ibm burblingen lab did lots of good measurements on on that and and really the the improvement is kind of a, a lot more than you might expect so so that is a good reason to to put some of these things on infrastructure nodes if you can. Now, once you have enough compute nodes for resilience, because obviously if a node, if a virtual machine uh, goes down, not necessarily because there's a problem, but remember that the cluster itself is, um, uh, is able to, and usually will be applying updates for lots of things and rolling all of that, those out concurrently. And the way that it will do those if it needs to, let's say, update the uh, the operating system within within the node, is it will drain the node. So is it it will move things off it as they become uh, eligible to do that until there's nothing running on it. It will take it down. It will apply the update. It will bring it back into the cluster, and things will then move back to it and gradually drift over to it as as necessary. That's the way that the cluster um, works. But once you've got enough uh, nodes for resilience on, on Z, because it scales up and out, basically, how, how, however you like. In other words, the, one of the real strengths of Z is the, whether you have lots of different you know, virtual machines or containers or whatever, or whether you have a smaller number of large ones, the overall capacity that you get out of it is, you know, predictable and, and pretty much the same. So, you know, it, it's as kind of as close to linear scalability as as as, as, as is possible. Um, so on, on Z, rather than have lots and lots more different little bits and pieces to manage, 
most of the time you're just going to be scaling up and giving the node you know, more memory and CPU. You, you're much less likely to get in a situation where adding CPU or memory to a node is making the software on it or the hardware unhappy because it's having to deal with all that resource. Um, on the other hand, if there are good reasons to separate things out onto other nodes, then by all means do so. And some of those good reasons can be the infrastructure nodes that I mentioned before. Uh, in the case that you're doing uh, ODF, OCS, then uh, as well as the licensed reason, the kind of it, it, it doesn't quite force you, it, it very strongly encourages you uh, to put those onto separate uh, nodes of its own. And there are, there are other kind of uh, operational reasons why you might want to put workloads on, on their own group of nodes for limiting things in, in various ways. Uh, and by all means, do that if you want to, but don't feel that you have to do so um, just in, in, in order to you know, get scalability or, or redundancy or whatever. What you tend to find on, on Intel and cloud systems is it's far more common to scale things out into having lots and lots and lots of these things. Um, in, in Z terms, feel free to scale up or out as you wish. So CPU capacity, uh, OpenShift is heavyweight. There's no getting around that. Uh, it does an awful lot of things. Um, so it's doing an awful lot of things that in a production large environment, you'd have to be installing and configuring lots of pieces of software to do. Um, you know, in, in inbound network, uh, um, redirecting to the right place as things move around the place, um, health checks, uh, um, alerting system, uh, metrics gathering, using those metrics to, to determine whether things are normal or not and trigger other parts of the cluster to behave differently or generate alerts or whatever it is. Um, all of these sorts of things, pruning, updating, it really is doing an awful lot and a cluster that you you know freshly installed it's got about 100 to 150 uh, pods running and doing stuff and you can kind of think of that as like on a on a large traditional system where, where it's demons which are sitting around doing things uh, or you know in, in the case of zos uh, you know various address spaces which are sitting there now in the case of zos um because of you know, the, the, the traditional uh, scarcity of, of, of CPU resource, the way that though, you know, they're doing things is incredibly tightly uh, uh, tuned. And so it isn't there sitting using an awful lot of CPU. Um, if you're running a bunch of ZOS machines under ZVM, then those of you who do that will know that you know, even the fact that, uh, that an idle ZOS system is taking, you know, three or four percent or six percent for a two-way cisplex of a, of a, of a CPU or, or something is you know it's kind of a, a bit more of a pain than you'd like um, in terms of OCP it's it's going to be sitting there burning about one and a half IFLs yeah so it's so a one and a half cores one and a half CPUs um, that that is really quite a, a, a culture shock if you're coming across OpenShift at, at the first point of uh, um, and the, the first thing to note, that is not meaning that there is overhead in the workloads that you then run on top of OpenShift. So the workloads that you run on top, you know, the, the programs that you're running are running in a container. But remember that a container is not a virtual machine. It's just a, an artifact of the, of the underlying Linux kernel which is presenting to the program that's running a different view of the file system. It's gluing together various parts of the file system from other, from other parts. Uh, it's gluing together sort of what, what the network interfaces you see and, and, use, and a few other things. There is, there's no kind of layering in there in terms of virtualization overheads. Um, and so the, the workloads that you run are, are you know, the same CP usage as they would if they were just running on your own manually installed, uh, uh, you know, a Linux virtual machine in there. 
Uh, but that doesn't get away from the fact that all of that control plane stuff for the clustering is, is using one and a half IFLs. And there are, um, you know, pricing things to avoid that. So there's kind of buy three IFLs for uh, compute nodes and you get three IFLs for control planes for, for free if they're microcode, those sorts of things. Um, this, this isn't a, you know, a, a salary thing and it's, you know, GSE, so that, you know, tight restriction rules on anything to do with the selling part. So uh, I, I'll just sort of mention that the, you know, the, the intention is that even the hardware sides of, of, of this are, are not intended to be, stop you from using OpenShift and cloud packs and so on. And, and that really is, uh, um, that really is the case. So once you've got over that, uh, and, and you start thinking, oh, one and a half IFLs, that's not too bad. You then start getting into how many, you know, virtual cores, how many virtual CPUs, these things. Um, and, and, and that's, again, another whole new culture shock to get used to when, when you see op open shift things for, for, you know, how many virtual CPUs get, get thrown around the place. Uh, so the official minimum Z requirements to install OCP, it says, is six IFLs on the Red Hat OpenShift page. So what that's giving you is 12 virtual CPUs with, with, with SMT uh, um, enabled and yeah, <laughs> yeah, enable, do, you know, do enable SMT. There's absolutely no reason not to. Um, and so effectively the, the virtual machines that you're setting up, the nodes that you're setting up for your OpenShift cluster, um, those are, are what kind of what you're handing out to them. And the official minimum for the number you need to give to each node is four. Uh, and you must give at least three. And that's not because each node is going to be uh, burning or, uh, you know, three IFLs. Because remember, even if you give a virtual machine a virtual CPU with SMT enabled, yes, if there's lots of other workload on, on that, um, system, then ZVM is probably going to be dispatching your virtual CPU on one thread and somebody else's virtual CPU on another thread of the same IFL. On the other hand, if your workload isn't peaking uh, uh, and using as much uh, capacity, then if you have three virtual CPUs on your virtual machine, then ZVM will be dispatching those three on three separate IFLs and you're, you're getting kind of the capacity of three IFLs, not one and a half IFLs. So it's a usual, whenever you're doing things with SMT, be careful about how you think of how much capacity an individual little piece is using. The point of SMT is overall, you're getting your approximately 25% extra capacity simply by enabling SMT. When it comes down to, well, which little piece of workload is, is benefiting and what happens if I double the workload, halve the workload, you know, increase the number of vCPUs, that's where the curve with the, you know, because of SMT becomes non-linear and, and, and needs a lot of uh, uh, careful thought. But from an overall capacity point of view, it's fine. Uh, so the reason for the fact that you must give at least three, nothing to do with SMT and hardware and capacity, it's because the way that OpenShift and Kubernetes works, uh, and a an individual pod, you know, a, a, an instance of workload is allowed to um, declare how much capacity it wants. Um, and it can either say, I'd like to have this, or it can say, I need this. Don't schedule me unless you have enough capacity. Doesn't mean it's gonna use it, but what it will do if it, if it uh, declares that it wants and needs it, uh, in other words, if its request is the same as its limit, then uh, the, the cluster itself will not start up that pod unless the capacity is available. And then when it does start it off, it, it fences off, it, it earmarks that capacity just for the use of the pod, and then won't use the, uh, that what it thinks of as a, you know, as a percentage of a, of a, of a CPU. Um, and so what you end up with, if you don't give these things enough virtual CPUs, is uh, your CPU utilization is really low. And OCP is simply saying, I don't have enough CPU capacity to start up these pods, so I'm not going to. 
and you sit there shouting at it and saying, yes, of course you do. Can't you see that you're, you know, you're only running at 10% <laughs> of the CPU, uh, but all that uh, uh, the, the counting that is being done within the cluster for this is just these numbers of CPUs, milli CPUs. And then the extra thing that makes that a pain on Z is that the capacity of an individual CPU is much more than it is on a, uh, uh, an Intel system, you know, two and a half to one, three to one, four to one, you know, kind of, kind of rules of thumb sort of things. Um, and if you think about the, the people who are, conf who are saying how their system software gets to run within the cluster, there is this tendency to be, to be conservative. So uh, uh, you're a developer writing some cluster internal stuff. You don't want to be getting support calls because people are running at too high CPU and you know, you're getting timeouts and you don't want to have to solve the timeout. So you just bump up the, the uh, how much you earmark and they are really are over generous on, on Z. So basically give your nodes plenty of, uh, um, you know, enough, plenty of virtual CPUs. And yes, you're kind of, you're over committing them onto, you might well be over committing them compared to the actual logical IFLs that, you know, that, that your LPAR has. Um, but the, the overhead from doing that, you know, Z, ZVM is, is really good at having lots of virtual CPUs. So, you know, don't worry about it too much. Once you've got over, you know, the, the problems here, then you might start looking at, okay, am I committing, over committing too much? Do I want to reduce it a bit? Uh, but don't get yourself in a situation where, you know, the cluster just isn't working because it's refusing to start stuff because it thinks that there isn't enough CPU. Right, and that this final bu bullet point is the, 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 the nice one. So it's been really difficult to find official statements that the, this this um, VPC, this virtual processor called licensing for OCP and, and for cloud packs for IBM cloud packs as well, lets you do what you want to do. So, uh, okay, if I have um, five nodes, three control planes and a couple of compute nodes, and I give them all four virtual CPUs, that's 20 virtual CPUs. Does that mean I need to license 20 VPCs? Um, or can I say, hang on a minute, this LPAR only has, let's say, six IFLs, therefore I only need to license six of them. Uh, and the answer is, you only need to license six of them. And I only recently found kind of a, a, a confirmatory chart that that's the case. I've heard people say, it. I've heard, you know, the um, official people and, you know, product owners and offering managers and so on say that, but it's been very difficult to sort of get, get um, it, it written down in black and white and there is uh, basically it behaves for those of you familiar with IBM subcapacity pricing for Z for, for Linux on Z we're, we're not talking ZOS subcapacity here um, IBM subcapacity on Z is what lets you count up virtual CPUs or logical IFLs or physical ones or ZVM CPU pools or resource pools and basically count them up, add them up until you get the absolute minimum number of, of all the various ways of adding them up and that's what you count. Uh, it's the same for uh, um, th this VPC counting and there's a nice chart some years ago uh, uh, a year or so after IBM subcapacity pricing came out which shows you you know, lots of boxes for LPARs and virtual engines and ways of adding them up and counting them, which shows you exactly, you know, the ways of counting them up and what it does. Uh, I found a similar chart for uh, VPC for OpenShift. Unfortunately, it's still marked as IBM only. And I've asked the author if I can use it for this presentation, but I probably asked them a bit late and I haven't got to reply yet. Um, so once that becomes available, uh, you know, anybody that knows me just kind of I'll, I'll ask me or whatever I'll, I'll make that because it, it's one of those charts which is really really useful and shows you it, the the counting behaves exactly like you'd hope it would um, so yes for, for that situation you know you've got five nodes you give them all four virtual cpus um you you know add another node you give it another four virtual cpus you bump one of them up, up to six or whatever your lpar only has six logical ifls that's fine 
you're only paying for, for six. If you then start saying, okay, well, I'm going to have other stuff running in this LPAR, uh, I'm going to give it another three IFLs, uh, then you can create CPU pools and you know put some of these nodes in those, put your infrastructure nodes out of those CPU pools. Um, so provided only the nodes needing to license uh, um, OCP or in the CPU pool, you're only paying for that limit that you put on the CPU pool. So it's it, this is really good for Z. Right, enough of that. Um, so memory. Um, official minimum is 16 gig. Uh, if you reduce that, it doesn't make things stop working. These days, kind of, you know, real kind of production systems have loads and loads and loads of memory but if you're getting started um and, and you don't want to go all out then uh, you know, I, I i know it's it's easier getting things going with you know going with a begging bowl and saying kind of just have this much capacity and we'll get started uh, official minimums for eight gig for the compute nodes um uh, and as i say you, you can split things out onto their own nodes if you want to but in general just Add, add the, the memory that's needed. Don't feel that you have to split things out. Networking, it, it, OCP is um, a, a, a microservice design. So it uses software defined networking, SDN. That's really, really nice. Uh, it means everything that you create via an API or the web interface or manually or whatever automatically gets its own IP address, its entry in the DNS, doesn't matter which node it's on, everything just magically works. But the various layering and hopping for that uh, has some performance overhead. Um, one thing that's newish, OCP now lets you choose what kind of SDN you want. There's OpenShift SDN which is the default, and there's a thing called OVN Kubernetes. And for low-level details to do with this uh, uh, Geneve, Geneve uh, versus VXLAN, kind of OVN, it's the right strategic direction to go in. But at the moment, I'd say, from what uh, uh, um, somebody tells me, it doesn't appear to be as mature or functional in OpenShift. So don't kind of automatically point it to it because people say, you know, that's the direction you should do, that, that things are going in. That overhead can sometimes be removed completely. So using different interfaces and hypersockets and Rocky and things like that. But some of the ways of doing that means that the way that the cluster can move things around and give you HA and resilience don't automatically work. And you have to start thinking about um, where what these nodes are labeling them so they go on the right one which where is which network interfaces is traffic going to go to so you can you know if things need to have low latency and high performance and things like that then you can take advantage of z for that but there might be trade-offs and, and complications in thinking how that will fit in with with how the cluster works so trade-offs sometimes it might be a good idea sometimes it might not be um, disk storage, I want to spend a, a decent length of time on this. Um, disk storage overall, you've got the ephemeral storage for the nodes. So that is basically just the disk. Uh, and I'm going to come onto that in the next chart. You've got persistent volumes. Um, and those in the OpenShift world are known as PVs. Uh, and for those that are, are newish to OpenShift, don't mix that up with a with a, a logical volume manager, an LVM PV. It's just an entirely different meaning of what PV is. Um, that's what's used to provide persistent disk storage for pods. Uh, and, and pods request those via this persistent volume claim. So a pod requests the attributes that it wants. The cluster has the PVs that it offers. The cluster binds appropriate ones together based on what you've asked for. And what you ask for can be based on size. It can do with whether you want it to share with other uh, um, pods and things like that. So you've got this read write once, RWO, read, one, uh, read once many, ROX, what we think of as RR in the ZVM world. In other words, every, uh, you can have multiple people linked to it read only. And RWX, read write many is the equivalent in the, in the zvm world of mw yeah so multiple people can get write access to it at the same time so that's the sort of thing that should make you say oh hang on a minute if you're going to do things with multi-write the underlying thing that's using it really needs to understand that 
So either it's understanding it because it's a you know a, a ZOS volume, or uh, it, it, uh, with uh, uh, you know GRS and everything, or it's understanding it because it's a a shared file system of some sort, which we're going to come onto in a bit. There's lots of different trade-offs uh, uh, for for various options here, lots and lots, and there is no obvious answer. Ephemeral disks are simply the node's own main disk, and the only thing to note there is because it's Red Hat Core OS underneath, it only installs on a single disk. Uh, so that needs to be big enough, and the official minimum is 120 gig. So you're all already in the, um, you're needing EAVs if you're using DASD rather than SCSI for that. If you absolutely need to, and your storage people need persuading to, to do EAVs, you can get started with the Mod 54. You know, it works, it's okay. If you go much smaller than that, then the node will work for a bit and then get really, really busy as it tries to prune stuff. And that can be a bit nasty. So I'd say don't go much smaller than, you know, don't, don't, don't try and fit things on a mod 27 or, or, or even worse, less than that. Persistent volumes are usually consumed as, as mounted file systems. Uh, sometimes now you can, uh, they're consumed as a raw block device, uh, um, less often though, and this is what the the pod is is seeing. That common mounted file system case is the owner's volume mode file system. And what's happening there is remember that the container is really just running as a process on Linux on the underlying virtual machine. So that node, that virtual machine, what it sees as disks and file systems and so on, parts of that are what the, the, the pod are using. So the way that you can present something to a pod is either the node can make a local file system on a block device, either because it's got the block device, you know, it, it's a locally attached disk, or because it's a remotely served block device, like SCSI or, or RBD are the ones we're going to mention in a minute. Or it might be that the node itself is mounting a remote served shared file system. So that's the case for things like NFS and, and Spectrum Scale and CephFS, and we're going to come on to those in a bit. Uh, the node is usually configured to reach out to storage either by, because Linux has it built in, like NFS, or because there's some software running within the cluster that does something cleverer. And that's where you get on to things like, uh, well, local storage operator is basically just looking at local disks and carving out um, PVs for you. ODF and Spectrum Scale are, are these big all-in-one complex things, and I've got a separate chart on those. Shared visibility disks, um, you can configure them as PCs, but a, a bit less dynamically. So in other words, if you're thinking, you know, I've got my amazingly fast, you know, DS8K or Flash System 9200 or whatever that my virtual machine's getting at those, does that automatically mean that you can easily carve those out into things that pods can consume? Not necessarily. So PVs are either created manually by the admin or automatically by a controller, and that's dynamic provisioning. Dynamic provisioning is more convenient, and what's happened over the last year or two is it's gone from being you know, a nice to have to some things are now starting to rely on it. Um, so just be aware of that. These big all-in-one storage solutions provide every possibility you can imagine for what the cluster wants to consume. They're really nice from that point of view, but I'm going to come on to the complexity. The two possibilities uh, uh, I'm aware of uh, uh, currently are ODF and Spectrum Scale. Uh, so CNSA is Container Native Storage Access. I always forget, but it's, you know, spectrum scale is, you're probably getting used to not calling it GPFS now, I just about am. This is really difficult, this, this has taken a remarkable length of time to, you know, to dig through and work out what's actually going on under the covers, because a lot of the diagrams that you see uh, really don't make this very clear. Spectrum scales, what's happening is, you're setting up an external spectrum scale cluster on other virtual machines or LPARs or, 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 or whatever. The way that spectrum scale works, obviously it talks to backend disks. 
uh, the spectrum scale word calls calls those NSDs, and those will you know on Z be on your DS8 or SAN or whatever. At the front end, it's serving up a shared file system, GPFS, to OpenShift. And the protocol that it uses for that is called the NSD client protocol, and that goes over TCP IP. Linux kernel doesn't have that NSD client protocol built in. So when you're doing OpenShift with Spectrum Scale, the, the nodes, uh, part of it in, in, includes putting the kind of the Spectrum Scale kernel extensions down into the node so that it understands this NSD client protocol and can remote mount uh, GPFS stuff. ODFS, uh, ODF is entirely different. So it is Ceph based. Uh, the Rook operator manages it. And there's object storage, which I'm not going to mention here as well, that it supports. Uh, you can either have it internal mode or external. External isn't yet supported on Z. And again, the idea there is that you would basically have an external Ceph cluster that's serving up storage to your ODF cluster. Even when it's internal within the cluster, you put it on a you know, its own set of nodes. Those nodes talk to their, uh, uh, the disks that you give to ODF, and they then serve up that disk via um, either a block protocol called RBD, which is a bit like iSCSI, or a shared file system, the CephFS shared file system protocol. And that also is built into the Linux kernel kind of a bit like NFS, so it's remotely mounting a, a shared file system. Again, over TCP IP. Uh, ODF can also serve up that, that, that block level um, to the node, and the node can then put a uh, kind of a normal file system on it uh, to make a PV, rather than using the CephFS, which isn't completely POSIX compliant. It's got some oddities. Uh, there, as has uh, spe spectrum scale in, in a file system point of view. So notice there, all of the I.O. that your workloads are doing, running on your pod on a node, all of that I.O. is getting it over TCP IP. So just because kind of you think you're on a cluster on Z and you've got very fast SAN stuff, the actual, all of those I.O.s are going over TCP IP. Um, if you're using ODF, it completely re-implements the uh, um, the way that it does all of its, um, uh, you know, holding disk data from scratch. It thinks the disks are completely commodity. It re-implements it kind of its own equivalent of RAID and copies. So every single I, uh, block, it writes three copies of. So every I.O. that you do to ODF uh, uh, from a pod is served up via TCP IP. If you're doing a write, it goes to ODF. That writes three copies of the data, does three IOs under the covers onto three bits of data on the disk, which then go down to whatever your disk uh, uh, storage is at the back end. It's worth considering that. Uh, last couple of charts. So pipelines. Um, this is Tekton pipelines with some uh, nice polish, nice web UI and various other things. Uh, 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 to make it uh, very, very nicely integrated into the cluster. This is pipelines as in uh, um, CICD and automation, not in the uh, uh, Linux, Unix, CMS, you know, run a program, pipe its output to another program. Uh, and just as an overview, so that you can think, what does this let me do? Uh, it has tasks, steps, and pipelines. So a task is a sequential set of steps. So each of which is running a container image. And remember, a container image is basically just you know, a program with its own you know, file system that it's sitting in. And that can just be a script, or it can be a program. It can be whatever you want to run. Uh, if you're familiar with ZOS, uh, think uh, uh, you've got a job. That's a list of job steps. Uh, each job step is running a program with some parameters. That's the equivalent of a task, a pipeline's task, running a set of sequential steps. Um, you can have named volumes that you sort of share between and, and, and pass them in and out of these steps and tasks as parameters in a similar way that in JCL, uh, um, you can use DD statements uh, uh, to pass kind of named data sets in between steps and jobs and things like that, kind of between steps anyway. Um, and then a pipeline is a collection of those tasks. Um, and you can either just run one after the other, or you can have as an arbitrary dependency graph. You just chuck a list of them and say, 
this these ones I want to run, but uh, this one needs to run after that one. Uh, ZOS has these days a thing called the Jez job group, which is not quite the same, but kind of that, that's the closest I can think of there. Uh, uh, and pipelines is really nice. Uh, it's really, really nice. So anything to do with sort of all automation and things like that, um, if you have kind of Java people doing Java that have been using Jenkins a lot. Jenkins is really quite Java specific. Um, uh, pipelines uh, lets you do a lot of that in a, in a cloud native way. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I, I really do quite like that. Um, finally, images and software. Uh, the, you know, the, the story is again that there's there's pretty much not a story now. The, the the whole thing about this is a different architecture and builds and availability and things like that. Um, the way that the containers and, and the cluster works, that problem really is pushed down and, and, and pretty much gone away. You know, so 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 once the, the way that people build software is based on you know images and the name of something, the fact that uh, um, you know it's Z anymore really. I, 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 I'm, I'm very happy that it's much, much less of a problem there. Um, okay, so uh, a few minutes. Any questions? Dave, has there been anything in the, uh, uh, in, the in the chat? Um, yeah, traditionally, um, with no no questions in the chat. <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> okay, it does, doesn't yeah, surprise me. Too. They're, yeah, usually very shy, unlike some of the uh, conferences I've attended in the US. <laughs> Okay, and any any verbal questions? I'm not sure if people come come off mute themselves or no, they can't. They, so they can't. It's, yeah, it's all through the chat. So, the chat. Um... Okay. okay. In which case, uh, um, thank you, everybody. Um, my contact details are uh, uh, there but for the, those that don't know me. The charts are now downloadable from GSE. And please, 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 please submit your session feedback. This is session 2AA. There's the URL. Um, please go do that. Um, and um, uh, shall, shall I I'll hand back to you, Dave, to, to finish and announce what's next in your stream? Well, I think you've, you've, um, you've, you've already done, the, done my job for me. So um, thank you very much, Malcolm. And thank you, everybody, for attending.